It all comes down to this. One final game, redemption for Purdue or a UConn dynasty. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Happy National Championship Monday. Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. We are your hosts. This is Andy Patton. I'm Isaac Shea, and you've joined us at The Place to get your college basketball content every single day. We'd like to thank you for making us your first watch or listen. By the way, you can listen ad-free every day on Amazon Music. Special shout out to all you everydayers who are with us, who have been here with us throughout the entire season. Andy, hard to believe it is the end of our second full season of doing this show, which by the way, today is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. Andy, before we get into things today, we got to shout out the current leaders of our locked on college basketball bracket challenge. Obviously, tomorrow we'll know the champ, but today the top three. Number one is Aiden Karoski. I hope I've said your last name right. Forgive me if not. Blake Widmer, or is it Widmer? Blake, I've never known. He's our guy. He's a Purdue fan. We're always hanging out. Good luck tonight, Blake. And then tied for third are Lawrence McMillan and Courtney Eaton. So we'll find out the final of that tomorrow. Coming up on the show today, basically here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk storylines of the national championship game. And then Andy and I are going to take a look at some of the individual matchups, X factors, give game predictions, all that. And then we'll wrap up the show in segment three, looking at uh, Bronny James entering either the draft or the transfer portal. Congrats to South Carolina on knocking off Iowa to complete an undefeated run to the Women's National Championship, 87-75. to 75. And Andy, I want to use that as a perfect segue into our men's game tonight because just like the women's game on Sunday was, tonight we've got a one seed versus a one seed the number one overall team versus the national player of the year. And obviously on our side of things, that's UConn versus Zach Eady and Purdue. Andy, this should be an epic showdown tonight, tipping off at 920 Eastern time on TBS. FanDuel has it minus six and a half. Look, Isaac, I am sad that this is the last pre-game projections preview show that we do for until I guess November, when we get back to the season, I always love getting a chance to look at these matchups and and get those opportunities. So uh, like you said, super excited to get through a second straight season here. Uh, feels like we just started, but also feels like we've been doing this for a long time, but uh, really excited about this game coming up tonight. Uh, it is definitely too late on the East Coast. Uh, it is a conversation that has been kind of beat to death, but uh, for the fact that these two teams are located, I, I guess, is Purdue in the Eastern time zone? I should know this. I, don't. I would think so. You keep talking. So I'll look it well. up. UConn obviously is. So either way, this is starting at, at 920 for UConn fans. I think 920 for, for Purdue <laughs> fans as well, even if it's 820. It's still too late. It's still too late. But um, it's an incredibly exciting matchup. It's the Eastern, matchup. Purdue's in Eastern. It's official. Keep it's going. official. Perfect. Uh, what I mean, it's just such an exciting matchup and an exciting game. And I, I, I mean, the, the amount of different conversations we can have about this game. I mean, there's just so many. It's the first time since 2021 we've had the two clear top teams in college basketball squaring off against each other in the NCAA tournament championship. That was a game that people were really hyped about that unfortunately didn't really deliver on the hype uh, in the sense that Baylor just absolutely waxed Gonzaga in the first 10 minutes of that game. And, and it kind of just played out somewhat not super interestingly after that. Uh, but hopefully this game will give us a little bit more than that. I think that it probably will. And Isaac, there's a handful of different storylines. Uh, and I'm just going to pick, I'm going to read a few here and have you pick which ones are your most interested coming into this game. Uh, the first one is the one that you and I have talked about so many times on this podcast, <laughs> which is the Big Ten hasn't won a national championship since Michigan State in 2000. That was a long time ago. Tom Izzo still the head coach of Michigan State. Still no championships for any of those teams can Purdue 
break that streak. Number two, same note, if Purdue breaks that streak, they also quote unquote pull a Virginia becoming the second team to lose to a 16 seed as a one seed and then win the national championship the following year. So Purdue has a chance to do both of those things. Meanwhile, UConn, they're looking to become the first repeat champion since the Florida Gators under Billy Donovan in 2006 and 2007. That is a huge storyline for uh, for UConn, for Danny Hurley's team. Not only that, they have won every game they have played in the last two NCAA tournaments by 13 or more points. Will that continue against Purdue? So not only will they win and win back-to-back championships, will they continue this streak of winning these games by, I don't want to say dominating because like, I mean, nobody who watched that Alabama game would call that dominant. That's a good word. That's a good word. 13 or more points is still a pretty significant margin. And then of course you got the big boys. Donovan Klingon, Zach Eady, first time a national championship matchup, has had two starting centers who are both seven foot two or taller. That is obviously a huge storyline here. Isaac, out of that, what what most intrigues you heading into this game? I think I, I've waffled on this a little bit, Andy, but I think it's going to be that first UConn one you mentioned. Because as I've, I don't think I had wrapped my brain fully around this, but since the field expanded to 64 teams in 1985, this would be just the third back-to-back national champion team. We had Duke in 91-92. We had Florida that you mentioned in 06 and 07. That's it, Andy. Mm-hmm. That is it. Before that, the last time we had a repeat champion was UCLA that had that seven straight year run from 67 <laughs> to 73. But Andy, that was before the field expanded to 64. Um, That was before the field started being seeded in 1979. For those who are unaware, prior to 79, there was just teams in there and they weren't seeded. But also in that entire stretch for UCLA, there were either 23 or 25 teams that made the field. And UCLA only had to win only, comparatively at least, only had to win four times to win the national championship. And so, Andy, what that Duke squad did, what Florida did, and what uh, UConn has a chance to do tonight, is is unbelievably otherworldly. And so when we say dynasty, when we say immortalized, yeah, that's a legit thing. And so Andy, that that to me is so, so intriguing. What about yeah, you? I think, yeah, you, you kind of touched on it at the end there, building on it. Like UConn, not only becoming the next team to win back-to-back championships like Duke did, like Florida did, like Florida never became a true basketball dynasty, but Duke obviously is and has been. And now if UConn were to win this, they would have more championships than Duke. And like, I don't think that UConn, like they have less final four appearances than Duke. They have less regular season championships, like a lot of, like they fall short of Duke in most every other respect, but And it's because they've never lost in the national championship. Right, because when they get to the Final Four, they pretty much always win it all. And and so, like, where UConn's place in that kind of dynasty conversation is already a bit polarizing, for lack of a better word. Like, people don't want to call them a blue blood. People say they're great, but they're not a blue blood. People say they already are there. Like, there's a lot of – and the blue blood term just is not as important to me as it is to a lot of people. But the the point is that the conversation around UConn is still a bit – like, are they really there yet? And to me, this some, this would cement it. I think they're probably already there. So maybe my opinion doesn't matter as much. But like, I think this would like ironclad. You win back to back. You know, you become the, again, Duke being the only other current like blue blood program that has done this. Like that really cements it for me. So so to kind of piggyback on UConn not only becoming a repeat champion and not only doing, uh, you know, not only winning all these games by 13 or more, which even if they don't do that here, like they also cement themselves as a legitimate, like superstar franchise and and one of the absolute greats of all time. And I think that's, that's a big part of this as well. Yeah. Right now there are only three schools that have six or more championships. Can UCLA with 11 Kentucky with eight North Carolina with six with a win tonight, Andy, they join that group. So you, my friend are spot on. Uh, the Andy, the other one that that really jumps out to me is the will they pull a Virginia side yeah. of it? Because at this point, it would then become a hundred percent. Yeah. And at that, I mean, I think we've joked about this before, but it's like, what what one seed is now trying to tank and lose to a 16 so that they can be guaranteed a national championship the next year? I mean, it really, really would be the most wild swing. Yeah. And to have it happen twice within a five tournament span or so is absolutely 
insane any crazy yeah, i think that's i think that's probably most people's pick like if you were to ask the general college basketball population among these storylines that's the one that is kind of capturing the most people's attention and i think for good reason but isaac that's the storylines but these stories they don't really mean much they're just blank pages without the players without the coaches without the actual content of the gameplay so we want to talk about what is the most intriguing matchup outside of the ones that we all want to talk about outside of Edie versus Klingon. what are the big matchups in this matchup who is ultimately going to be the 2024 national champion we're going to get to all of that but first I want to tell you that today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Folks, when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. Thankfully, LinkedIn is not just another job board. They have a vast network of more than a billion professionals, making it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals that you cannot find anywhere else, and LinkedIn does all of that while making the process both easy and intuitive. Hiring is super easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats, and they may not have the time or the resources to hire, so they're constantly finding ways to make the process even easier, including launching a feature to help you write your own job descriptions. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Isaac, let's get into the actual matchups here, the on-court action that we're going to see between the UConn Huskies and the Purdue Boilermakers on tonight here on Monday. Obviously, the big storyline in terms of matchups is going to be Edie versus Klingon, and we're going to get to that. It's it's an iconic matchup between two of the really like of the monstrous players in college basketball, like just two absolute titans. But I want to talk about some of the other matchups, and I'm going to throw it to you first. What else outside of the big men kind of stands out to you in terms of on-court matchups, whether it's players on players or, or other kinds of things that might stand out in this game. The one that, that I think of first, Andy, is the Braden Smith of it all. And again, as we've said so many times, kudos to him and Fletcher Lawyer for how they've just truly, truly grown into something much better as sophomores. But Braden Smith in so many ways is the, the straw that stirs the drink mm -hmm. for Purdue because – this man, as, as we've said a lot this season, is putting up triple doubleish kind of numbers night in and night out uh, in the national semifinal, even though he only had three points, had like eight and six in terms of boards and assists. And so who is UConn going to put on him to shut down that? Because if he can't get the ball to Zach Eady, somebody else is going to have to, for example. So for me, uh, I'm looking at it either being Tristan Newton, who would be the natural point guard on point guard, or similar to what UConn did on Saturday night against Alabama, putting Steph Castle and his 6'6 frame on Mark Sears, might they do the same thing on a shorter Braden Smith? I'm really curious to see either way of that. And I think the other probably is on Lance Jones. Andy mm -hmm. is my thought. So that one will be interesting to watch, and we'll find it out as soon as the ball is tipped tonight and Purdue has possession of the ball. What about you? You're yeah, not even it... clinging matchup. Yeah, kind of piggybacking right off of yours there. For me, it's 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 Lance Jones. Like it's it's Ooh. who who defends Lance Jones, and then kind of the flip side, who does Lance Jones defend? And it's kind of been a topic that we've we've addressed a few times when talking about Purdue and some of the matchups that they've been in. Is they don't have a lot of big guards. Like they start three guards, and and they don't really have like a, a wing sized guard. So they sometimes. You know, we've we've wondered if they were going to struggle getting into matchups where they're playing teams that have multiple kind of bigger guards. And that's going to be the case against this UConn team that starts Tristan Newton, who's 6'5", that starts Cam Spencer and, and Steph Castle. I know Castle's 6'6". Six, six. I think Spencer's 6'4". Spencer's I looked six, it up earlier. Four, so he's the yeah. smallest. And if I'm not mistaken, he's taller than all of Smith, Lawyer, and Jones. I believe that's none right. of them are right. taller than 6'4". So, so there's just going to be and, – and, and height doesn't is not the only determining sure. factor, obviously, but right. the length on the perimeter is going to pretty clearly be an advantage 
for UConn and, and Lance Jones. And, and we're going to talk about X factors. And I went with somebody else for my X factor, but in a lot of ways, Lance Jones strikes me as the player that is going to have a big impact on this game, whether he has a positive performance or not, because if he's able to space the floor and he's getting out in transition and he's kind of, you know, getting past guys and, and out athleting, out athleting some of those guys on UConn, that could be a problem a matchup issue for, for Danny Hurley's team. But if they stick, I mean, if they stick castle on him, certainly uh, that frees up Braden Smith a little bit, but that would probably neutralize Jones. So mm. it's kind of similar to yours of, of just how are these two teams going to attack each other on the perimeter and what are those, those matchups going to look like, uh, in the backcourt because I think that's going to have a lot of weight in this game. Fletcher lawyer is the biggest of that backcourt group at six, four. So their tallest backcourt player is the shortest backcourt player for UConn. Andy, you mentioned uh, X factors. Let's go there next. Why don't we just throw it right back to you while you're already talking about it? Give us your X factor. Yeah. I went with Mason Gillis for Purdue Ooh, uh, nice. and, and I, yeah, I think, you know, you can't call Edie an X factor, really. I mean, he's the, the <laughs> biggest factor, obviously. I think Braden Smith's a bit of a cheat there, too. And and uh, I already kind of talked about Lance Jones as the matchup kind of conversation there. So Gillis, to me, is, is somebody who you've seen Purdue utilize in really – effectively throughout this tournament and, and throughout, I mean, really throughout his career at, at, at Purdue up to this point, he's, he can space the floor a little bit. He kind of gives Purdue a different look when he's in the game. Uh, when they bring him in for Kaufman Ren, it kind of gives them a four out sit situation where they have four guys who can shoot from perimeter and then Edie in the middle. And I think, his ability to pull defense away from ED, like they can't, they'll have to go cling in one on one, which again, no team in the entire country is better equipped to defend Zach ED one on one than UConn. But if they wanted to kind of cheat Caravan down, like that's going to be more difficult if Gillis is in the game as opposed to Kaufman Wren, because Gillis can knock down those corner threes and can really kind of make that defense have to be more ha have to force Edie to be defended one-on-one -on -one. and so I think Gillis also can create some some issues defensively like on defense for Purdue so I'm I'm looking for Mason Gillis to have a big game because I think similar I mean I think everybody for Purdue is going to pretty much have to play close to their a game to beat UConn that has been the yeah. case uh, against UConn throughout the years but uh, if if Gillis can come off the bench hit a couple corner threes uh, force UConn to defend him that that can that could potentially create some challenges for the Huskies. So Andy had the assignment on Purdue's X Factor. My assignment was the UConn X Factor. And I'm going with Steph Castle, who we talked about just in passing there. Uh, we saw him score a bunch of points yeah. on Saturday night, Andy. And look, we know that the defense is going to be there for him. We know that the athleticism is going to be there. In fact, he might be the best athlete on the entire court in this basketball mm -hmm. game. But Andy, the, the X Factor nature with him is the shooting and the extra buckets, and getting to the rim, getting out in transition and running. And so this season, he has now had four 20-point games, interestingly enough, one each month. So I guess he's already used up his April quota. But, uh, you know, even if he doesn't get to 20, if Steph Castle could get into that 15 to 20 range, mm -hmm. to me, that's what UConn really needs to fill out. You know, we see them consistently having a balanced scoring approach. So that's what I'm looking for in it. Looking ahead to the, the leading score projections for this game, and, and I'm going to take the obvious one here. I'm going to take Zach Eady. Uh, and I, I, I we'll get to our actual score projections and everything like that. And I think Purdue, again, they're going to have to be more balanced. Uh, they're going to have to be a bit more egalitarian than usual if they want to win this game. But this is a team that's more than capable of that. Like, people are going to focus on Eady's having that 40-point game. But, like, they haven't gotten to this point purely on the back of Zach Eady offensively. And, and I think that we are going to see – you know, Braden Smith's going to have to step up. Lance Jones going to have to step up. But at the end of the day, I think Edie's going to – we've seen Edie play 38, 39, 40 minutes. We have not seen Donovan Klingon do that. And while I think Samson Johnson's a good player, Zach Edie's going to eat when Donovan Klingon is on, the, is, is on the bench. And if he can do anything to get him in foul trouble, if that, if that becomes an issue at all for UConn, that could change the dynamic of this game in a major way. So for me, I think Edie's the leading scorer in this game. I got him at 26. Uh, so a little, you know, around his season average, which would be very impressive against this UConn team. I think he's going to be in that range uh, because I just think that Purdue is going to have to rely on him so much to, to be their offense. I'm going to go with Mr. Cam Spencer, Andy. Uh, it feels like UConn, not feels like, it's true that UConn has not shot at their best throughout this tournament. And mm -hmm. it's just, we always look for like, who's just going to kind of break out of a shell and go nuts in these big time moments. Give me 21 points for Cam Spencer, 15 of which come off of five 
threes. It just feels like somebody's going to open up and just start raining them in. Mm -hmm. And why not the mouthy dude that is Danny <laughs> Hurley Jr., basically. And then we get some of his fist pumps and he's yelling and pumping up the yeah. crowd. So uh, that would be something, though, if Zach Eady's not the leading scorer. I'm obviously going out on a limb with that one, but we'll see it happen. And you mentioned Zach Eady. We got to talk the big boys there uh, because we, we've put it down because that is the biggest storyline and, and we're not trying to bury the lead. It's just, that's all anyone's talking about ever. Yeah. So we want to try to fill out the, uh, fill out the preview a little more here, but Andy, Zach Eady, Donovan Klingon player efficiency rating. They are number one and number two in all of college basketball. Looked it up earlier today. Pretty bonkers. Interestingly enough, Janai broom number three in that list, but Andy, Two seven-footers. You mentioned it's the first time we've ever had two starting centers, seven-two or greater. The last time we had two seven-foot, the last and only time we had two seven-foot starting centers was some dudes named Elijah Wan and Ewing, Andy. <laughs> Are we getting that kind of classic matchup here? Yes and no. I mean, yes, in the sense that I think it's that level of elite college matchup. Now, obviously, I... I you know, no disrespect to these two guys, but they're probably not going to become first ballot NBA Hall of Famers the way that That's Hakeem Olajuwon right. and Patrick Ewing did. The fact that those two guys both, you know, met and exceeded expectations out of college is, is very crazy. But uh, I, I think that this matchup is going to give us a lot of absolute classic moments. And I'm really excited to see how it shakes out. Like how, how much are these teams trying to go in to the bigs? Like, are they going to kind of attack each other? Like is Edie going to go to work over that shoulder and try to get Klingon in foul trouble is more, I guess more on the other question is I'm curious if UConn is how much are they going to go down to Donovan on the block? Yeah. And because I think for UConn attacking the, attacking the opposite side rim and trying to make Edie get out of his comfort zone and, and defend away from, you know, move in space and defend. He sometimes kind of, doesn't go for that because he doesn't want to pick up fouls. So I could see Danny Hurley and UConn like telling Tristan Newton, like, Hey, beat guys off the dribble and get, get downhill, get to the cup. And if Edie blocks four shots in a row, Edie blocks four shots in a row. Like he's capable of doing that. But if you can get him in a situation where he's a little uncomfortable, you might be able to pick up some points that way, or the best case scenario is get him in foul trouble, which he is exceptionally good at avoiding. But that's, that's where I think there's, I mean, this could be a, this could spin off like six different storylines just between the Edie Klingon matchup. I mean, I think if you were to tell me that these two guys kind of cancel each other out in this game, in my mind, and I'm curious your thoughts here, that's advantage UConn and that's kind of by a decent margin. And that's no disrespect to produce supporting cast. They're great, but UConn's is outstanding. And so I think if these two guys are going to cancel each other out, uh, then I think you're going to go advantage UConn. But in my head, I don't think they're going to, I think Edie's going to get the better of Klingon, although I think they'll both play very well. I'm of the exact same mind, Andy. If they neutralize each other, advantage UConn. Um, and so for my money, it's like if Klingon can be within either five points of Zach Eady in terms of holding him under his average or scoring up to that, mm -hmm. I, I think that is more than enough to give UConn the advantage they need to win this basketball game. But as we always know, it's got to actually play out on the court, and we can't wait to see it happen. That said, Andy, let's get some score predictions here. How will this thing play out? Who's cutting down the nets? Is it a redemption tour, or is it a UConn dynasty? What are you going with? I'm going with UConn, but I am not projecting UConn to continue their streak of 13 plus point victories. I think it'll be closer than that. I have a final score of 82 73. That's a pretty offensive focused game, uh, but I got UConn by nine. I got them taking home back to back trophies and really cementing their legacy as one of the, the true dynasties in this sport. Andy, I'm also going with UConn, but I am keeping that 13-point spread intact exactly with a 79-66 win for UConn. The Huskies just under their season scoring average there. Now, Andy, while that championship game that we've been talking about is clearly the focus of today's show, as well it should be, oddly enough, there's plenty of other college basketball content happening in the world. Bronny James is both declaring for the draft and in the transfer portal what's ultimately going to happen. And Andy, we'll talk about all of that. Coming up in just a second. All right, Andy, we it's it's funny because last week, earlier in the week, there was this rumor that mm -hmm. Ronnie James was uh, entering the transfer portal, and that broke like just as we were about to record a show. I can't remember what day it was, but it felt sort of reputable, sort of unreputable, so we didn't go with it. We didn't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. 
now we know that it it is official. I'm, you know, it's a whole thing. But Bronny James is doing the thing that a lot of people will do of declaring for the draft while maintaining collegiate eligibility, but also entering the transfer portal so that if he does decide to come back to school, he's going to go somewhere else. Andy, this just, again, as the whole his recruitment was, his whole commitment was, it's the storyline that it is because of whose son he is. He mm-hmm. has grown and he has risen. But there is the LeBron James of it all. Andy, the funny, funny, funny quote about this was he said something about one of the Antetokounmpo brothers can go, I forget which one, forgive me, mm-hmm. can go sit on the bench on Giannis's team. Can't I do the same with whoever my dad is playing for? I love that, um, Andy. So there's that storyline of it. And obviously the where would he go if he comes back to college of it all? Andy, what do you make of all of this with Bronny? Yeah, I'm not surprised he declared for the draft. I think it would have been it would have been more surprising if he didn't do that. And I think he should. I think any player who's not intending to stay all four years should declare for the draft basically every year because you can. And, and you get that feedback and it's it's valuable for you. It's valuable for the scouts to get an extra look at you. Like I think I think this is a, a the right decision for Bronny. But I don't think that he's ready to be an NBA player. And I don't think that that's even really a particularly a hot take. He 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 didn't play all that well at USC, and a lot of it was factors outside of his control. The team was bad. I don't think the fit was all that good, which is partly the team's fault and partly his fault. He picked to go there, um, but I, I I he didn't shoot very efficiently. He averaged under five points per game. But you look at the red, like the defense is there, the basketball IQ is there. I think some of the offensive stuff will come around in time. He you know he he missed the part of the season. He was recovering from like major heart surgery. So like I think it's reasonable to have tempered expectations for him. But I'm insanely curious where he goes. And I'm going to throw out a school that I'm, I'm far, far from the first person to throw this school out there, but it's going to, if you haven't heard this before, it's going to rattle some heads a little bit, but there is a, a strong connection between Bronny James and the James family and Duquesne, the Dukes of Duquesne in the, in the A-10. Uh, their head coach, Drew Joyce, played high school basketball with LeBron at St. Vincent, St. Mary's in, uh, in Akron, Ohio. And so LeBron has been incredibly close with the Joyce family for 20 plus years. He was the one who broke the news that Drew Joyce was taking over as the head coach uh, at Duquesne. The former head coach, Keith Dembrot, retired because he had been LeBron's high school basketball coach. So he has multiple connections. In fact, when Duquesne beat BYU in the NCAA tournament, they were all wearing LeBrons because they were sent to them by LeBron himself. Now, LeBron and Bronny are different people, and that is an important thing to acknowledge that just because his dad's high school teammate is coaching at Duquesne, it doesn't mean that Bronny has some obligation or is obviously going to go there. But Bronny could benefit from going to a school where he gets more of the keys to the kingdom. He gets to take over as the starting point guard. Duquesne lost Day-Day Grant. They lost their other guard. Forgive me, I can't remember his name. Who were their two leading scorers last year? Both are out of eligibility. So he gets to step in, gets to play for a family friend, gets to play in a competitive conference in the A-10. It's not the same level as, you know, the Big 12 or the SEC or even, you know, what was the Pac-12 last year at USC. But he gets to play quality opponents. And for a lot of players, it's like, oh, you get to kind of disappear and hide under the radar. That will never happen. For Bronny, like that's like that's not a part of this. What will happen is Duquesne will become a much more popular watched team next season. But there's a lot of factors lining up that this kind of makes some sense. I have yeah. no idea if this is the choice that Bronny is going to make. Uh, some people are treating it like it's mostly just a joke. But when you look at it, there are some plenty of reasons why this could realistically make some sense for Duquesne, for Bronny, for the family, and and, and it could help him, you know, get to his eventual goal of playing in the NBA. Yeah, I think, Andy, the way I like to say about things like this is there's a greater than 0% chance, Yeah, right? What, what, how much greater than zero? I don't know, but I, I, I think it is bigger than a joke. There is yeah. more reality than that. Similarly, like, might he follow Andy Enfield, the SMU? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Perhaps so. Uh, you know, you, you had mentioned that um, Jackson State head coach mm-hmm. Mo Williams obviously yeah. played with LeBron. Like, yeah. maybe there's some of that in it. So, mm-hmm. Um, like helping raise the HBCU profile. And so there, there's just lots of who knows, you know, there was obviously all the talk about Ohio State mm-hmm. prior to his commit. So we'll just have to wait and see. Well, Isaac, that is going to wrap it up for us today. Our final preview episode of the 2023-24 college basketball season. We will be back with you all live tonight after the game. It'll be 
probably Tuesday by the time some of you all are listening <laughs> on the East Coast. But we are so excited for our final live show of the season going live right after the game. Check us out on YouTube. You can find the audio version of that uh, the next day as well. I want to thank all of you so much who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day today and at any point throughout the season. Isaac, it has been an absolute blast getting through year two here. Excited for one more game, one more round before we get fully into the offseason and the coaching carousel and the transfer portal and all the other good stuff that's coming our way. Thanks again to all of you out there. And until next time, apologies to the lawyer family. We'll see if we're saying that again tomorrow. Let's go Kansas State Wildcats keeping their coach. And until Monday night, peace.